In part three, we're going to look at the fingerprints of God in the formation of our atmosphere. And with the development of life, we're going to look at the early and intermediate life formed developments. Now here's the timeline for the formation of the earth in its earliest life form. We know it began as a molten mass 4.6 billion years ago. It was bombarded by asteroids that brought carbon and water in the form of ice. And then somewhere about 3 billion years, the land masses had formed as a single mass and the rest of it was sea. But from the sea, along the edges of the land masses, you begin to form early life forms called archaea and bacteria. Now they still exist today in the same form. Then as you get down to 1 billion years, you started getting some of the bacteria began to develop chlorophyll and have, they were called cyanobacteria, and some oxygen started to come into the atmosphere. Up to this point, there is no oxygen in the atmosphere that survives. There may have been some present at the time of formation, but it all disappeared. Then at 1 billion years, you're going to have the development of the eukaryocytes, which are much more developed than the bacteria and the archaea. And they are aerobic, they have aerobic metabolism and they use oxygen to, be, to create energy. After that, you get to the 541 million years. This is called the Precambrian area, and at 541 it starts the Cambrian area, where all of the life forms that originally were all in the sea began to come on land, initially as plants and then later as animals. Now here are some of the events that happen in the formation of the atmosphere. Once you begin the Earth, it starts to cool, and you have a lot of volcanic eruptions, which deliver a lot of ammonia, methane, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide is all released into the atmosphere. There may have been some existing oxygen at that time, but the ammonia, and, uh, com ammonia combined with the oxygen to make nitrogen and water, so the oxygen disappeared, and methane and oxygen made carbon dioxide in water, so it again disappeared. So the early atmosphere did not have any oxygen within it after a certain period of time. Then the water be, uh, arose from evaporation of the seas and now you get water vapor in the air combined with carbon dioxide and nitrogen and that's when what most of the atmosphere was composed of along with the remnants of the ammonia and uh, the other relatively toxic substances. But along the way somewhere around 3 billion years you get the primitive life forms which are the archaea and the bacteria they formed in the water and later down around 1 million 1 billion years ago you started to get photosynthesis and these were called the cyanobacteria and they were able to make oxygen out of carbon dioxide and water which started to increase the atmosphere we'll talk about that and later ozone formed from oxygen and made it in the upper atmosphere which blocked the UV light coming in from the Sun which beginning in the, the, the years 541 million years ago allowed the plants to come on to develop and to come onto the earth. Once that happened, then the plants used carbon dioxide and, ox and uh, sunlight and were able to put an atmosphere in there because they had chloroplasts, and we'll talk about that along the way. Now, the, as we follow the Earth's timeline, we get down towards the first living creatures, the archaea and bacteria, that's their name. Archaea is an organism that still exists in the hydrothermal plants in Finland it hasn't changed much. The bacteria, of course, have gone, uh, undergone immense uh, change and development. But if you start with preceding it, there's just material floating around. There's nothing organized. There's nothing made. And then all of a sudden, in a very short period of time, you have life. So what has to happen to a single cell? Here you see it has has to have an outside wall that has channels that are smart, they let good stuff in and bad stuff out. You have to have an energy system. You had to have DNA to run the whole thing. You have to have an instruction manual that's very complex and to make DNA and to have it change to do what you want to do, to, have, you know, to develop more cells, to develop limbs, whatever, it takes an incredible amount of additional creation of DNA and there's no obvious way that that can happen except by a creative event. And finally, they have to reproduce. So all of these things, things, things do you think can happen randomly, just by accident, in scalding water with toxic chemicals? I think not. This is clearly a major, creating life is an 
as big a deal as the Big Bang. Now as we continue down the timeline, we get from 3 billion down to 2 billion years and you start getting a change in the bacteria and they start to develop chlorophyll. Now why they dreamed this up, I don't really know and there's no good explanation, nobody knows. They did and now they were called cyanobacteria and they could start making oxygen. Now what do they look like? Well these were bacteria that weren't actually in the water. All the others were in the water but now these grew up onto the land and they look like blue-green algae. It looks just like algae. And the, the rocks they were on were called strombolites. They're still here today. You can find them in certain parts of the world. So they're still around. But the question is, why would these bacteria want to make chlorophyll, dream it up, and why did they dream it up? Who knows? To make oxygen, since they didn't need it. They are anaerobic. They didn't use oxygen. So the answer, this makes absolutely no sense unless down the road, some other creation, millions and billions of years later, would want to use oxygen, like us. This can only be part of the Creator's visionary plan. Two billion years ago, the process starts to give us oxygen and change the atmosphere. Now here's a look at what the atmosphere and, of course, this dissolves in water would look like way back at 4.5 or 4 billion years. It's methane and ammonia and sulfur dioxide are all introduced from the volcanoes and there's nitrogen, carbon dioxide, all the water got, remember all the oxygen got used up mixing with the ammonia and the nitrogen so it wasn't any oxygen. And that's where it starts and somewhere down about in here you start getting these early forms, the archaea and the bacteria and the bacteria are somewhere around 2 billion years started to make the cyanobacteria which started to make some oxygen but the oxygen levels were very low and they would come up over time but they really got a boost when we get to the eukaryotic cells and we'll talk about that in a minute because these are the green plants that we see even today now the next step in organism formation is the development of eukaryotic cells now we translate that to be you and put an R on it, and then cells. So they're really your cells. And these cells will ultimately turn into plants and animals. But they're very important. The eukaryotic cells are going to develop a nucleus with nuclear DNA, which is now double-stranded and encapsulated, mitochondria with their own mitochondrial DNA, which ends up coming from the maternal side of the organism, and then it's used for aerobic metabolism, which is what we use, and then the development of chloroplasts, which are chlorophyll-laden structures within plants, and they come with their own DNA as well, and they're used to make glucose and oxygen out of sunlight and CO2. But this is kind of amazing because these are the kinds of structures we need oxygen and glucose even early but later we especially need glucose to have brain uh, metabolism so this is this was placed very early a billion years uh, before we even showed up and when that we're the an the animals are going to have to use glucose all those that have a neural system in a brain so it's a lot of preparation but the eukaryocytes develop into plants and animals and we'll show you how that happens now the plants are the first to come on earth so at 541 million years not billion years the lichen the green stuff gets all over the rocks and over the land that makes a ton of oxygen and pretty soon you have a whole atmosphere filling up with an atmosphere filling up with oxygen and then all the other development happens after that now we want to focus on the seven major creative events and we're up to the dynamic DNA. Now remember DNA is the cookbook for every cell. It's a very complex structure composed of amino acids arranged in a very precise manner in order to make all the proteins we use. Almost everything we have is a protein. This is just way too complex to be a random accident. So we call this the fourth of, this, of the major creative events. Now here's my creation of, a, of my attempt to make a single archaea or bacterial cell. And we point out that it has to have a cell wall. The cell wall has to let nutrients in, these little vacuoles of nutrients. They have to come in and they have to be processed and you have to make metabolism. 
and that creates debris and these little the cell wall has to let it out through these channels right here and here now the whole thing is driven by the DNA which in uh, one of these cells is just floating around in there. It's the single cells it could be called RNA or DNA but the DNA is the cookbook it's the instruction manual for the for everything going on in the living cell every single thing this has a recipe for the inner and cellular walls it had to make these things it had to make the walls it had to make the channels in the walls it had to make enzymes that makes all the digestion of the material these this is the material floating in and it has to have it work and has the way to get rid of the debris from that it has to have the recipe to move around it had to have a recipe for getting rid of debris. It had to have a recipe for reproduction. All of this is related to this uh, DNA. That is the director. That is the cookbook. And it appears to have come out of nothing despite its marked complexity, even in a single cell archaea and bacteria. The next major cell, uh, development in cell formation was that of the eukaryocytes. Now we call these U, like Y-O-U-R, your carrier cells. So these are your cells. These are the primitive cells that ultimately will end up as human beings. Now these single cells had to have a great deal of functions and they included a smart cell wall channel to let stuff in and let some stuff out. It had an energy source which was the mitochondria. It has to use oxygen which came from the chloroplasts in the plants. It had to have metabolic pathways to run everything and to make everything. It had to have DNA. And now we have DNA encapsulated in its own little capsule in what's called the nucleus. So it's double-stranded. It's in there. And it's very complex. Then there's also mitochondrial DNA and chloroplast DNA. Now, just so you understand this, let's look at a cell phone for comparison. So if we have an outer cell wall, so does the cell phone. There it is. Inside we have to have DNA to run everything. It has to have uh, a little computer. And there it is. There's the computer in your cell phone. It has to make energy. Well, so does the phone. Here's the battery. Here's the mitochondria. The battery, if this doesn't, if it runs out of juice, the phone doesn't work. The same is true. If the mitochondria don't work, the cells stop functioning. And then you have to have certain functions going on within the phone to get on the internet and call, uh, make various calls. And that's equivalent to our chloroplasts because they have to, they developed in order to make a lot of oxygen to fill up the atmosphere and enough oxygen enough oxygen can't say that they have to have enough oxygen for all the cells to all the eukaryotic cells to function we know the eukaryotic cells will become one line goes to animals and one line goes to plants now why you might ask is the karyocyte formation such a big deal well the early life forms called prokaryocytes were archaea and bacteria and they've gone all the way from the initial three billion years ago right up to the present. These were simple cells. They used nutrients but they didn't use oxygen. But somewhere down the road some of the bacteria started to develop chlorophyll which could make oxygen. Which is interesting because they didn't really need it. But they started to make it and it went into the atmosphere. Then about a billion years ago eukaryocytes were added. Now the eukaryote, eukaryocytic cells translate that into your. Your cells were developed and they had a nucleus with now double-stranded DNA. Big time change in DNA out of the blue. Who can do that? Well it's certainly not random chance. Then you develop mitochondria which are complex organelles and you develop chloroplasts. Now let's look at what happened there. So you get two cell lines the ones that have the cell, the nucleus, the nuclear DNA, and atom mitochondria end up coming, becoming eukaryotic animals. This is where all the animal line comes from. The others, cell line, is the nucleus and the nuclear DNA. They add the mitochondria for energy, and they add chloroplasts, which allow them to become plants. They use the chlorophyll to make oxygen. And notice that it's green. That's why we've colored all of these green, because you still have green leaves, green flowers. You have all kinds of uh, green things, and those are all the plants that contain the chlorophyll, and they make oxygen, which comes back. This is the cycle of life. It comes back to the animals so they can function. Now we're going to look specifically at the fifth major creative events, because it really is important. We call this the jolly green chloroplasts. 
It's a great event because the most the chloroplasts and mitochondria developed by themselves. They did not come by changing something else. They weren't they weren't just added on. They were created. There's no predecessor for them. And the chloroplasts we're going to discuss are we already introduced them as the organelles that are going to produce oxygen. Now, why are chloroplasts such a major creative event? Because they enable, these are the enablers of the circle of life, because they were, they figured out all on their own how to take carbon dioxide and light, sunlight, and, tr and transport it into the cell and create oxygen. And the chlorophyll is green, so all of these organisms are green. They release both oxygen and glucose. So the plants make glucose and the, the plants make oxygen. We're going to need both of these in time for all the eukaryocytic animals to survive. Now let's note that all early karyocytic plant cells are providing the stuff for animals that have not yet been created. You realize that these cells are doing everything for something that's not going to happen for another billion years. This is truly a remarkable creative event in God's visionary plan. Now the sixth of the major creative events is the mitochondria. The mitochondria has its own DNA, so it's very sp specialized. And we know that this comes because now you have uh, sexual reproduction, that the DNA for the mitochondria lives only in the maternal side. The maternal genes have that, and that's going to be important because we're going to study maternal DNA mitochondrial DNA uh, in today's world. We look at that to compare one species to another. So this is way down the road is going to come out in what we do today. Now the mitochondria make the fuel to run the engines of every cell. They supply what's called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So it's a it's a substance that has is run the juice is provided by this phosphate. And this is the energy source to do all every cell for it to do work. So every functioning cell in your body has mitochondria and that is, it has and every plant has the same so every animal and every plant has mitochondria but only the plants have the chloroplast now with this graphic I'm going to show you what a mitochondria actually does because it's very complex remember this is a single cell animal formed in primordial soup which is pretty toxic and it just develops this it started the early bacteria in archaea but this is a huge step up because of these mitochondria and what it looks like is, is its own unit. It has it, This is a cell margin for the mitochondria, and this is the inner cell margin of the mitochondria. Now what happens is bi biochemical reactions produce high energy molecules. They come floating into the mitochondria. Now what the mitochondria do through these four different areas, these, these are structures. They're actually physical structures that take protons off of this this molecule it pulls off a proton and shoves it out in this space and all three of them do that for various various types of material some of these energy molecules differ but it, they basically all take the protons off so now there's no protons inside there's only protons outside and electrons in the inside now what happens is these protons accumulate when they get enough of them because of the osmotic radiance they go shooting down the suit and it's just like a windmill. What it does is the is like wind, and it comes right through, and it turns this little crank. And it truly, with the microscopic examination of these electron microscopes, it actually looks like a little wheel. It turns these, and this wheel goes around. It takes one chemical called ADP, and it turns it into ATP. And we already told you about ATP. This is the gasoline. This is the fuel that runs everything in our body. So it makes that. Well, it dumps the protons inside. And they say, well, what do we do now? Well, oxygen comes along, and it combines these highly toxic structures. You can't have free electrons floating around, nor free protons, and so it accumulates them, and it makes water. So the oxygen table takes these electrons and the protons and makes water. And it's all done, all directed by the mitochondrial DNA. Now, life on Earth went through various phases. We call these eras. And the Paleozoic era is the one that had the most action. Now, what happens in this? It begins at five with the Cambrian part, which starts at 40, 541 million years ago. Up to now, everything is in the sea, but at 541 million years ago, there's now oxygen in the atmosphere, and some of the plants, 
Remember the eukaryotic plants come up on the land and they proliferate very quickly. They make a lot of oxygen and then the eukaryotic animals come on along this pathway. And you can see these are millions of years, millions of years apart. But why are they, are they divided up in all of these subsections? All these different eras. Well, what ends up happening is that at every one of these gaps, there, this is a big extinction comes. So there's six major total extinctions and numerous ice ages. So the atmosphere, which you can see the oxygen going up, and every time the oxygen goes down, there's, there's another crisis. So a crisis here, extinction here, extinction here. And ultimately, you, you, an extinction means you lose a lot of the plants and animals, including those in the water and on land. And in the last one, it was a very serious extinction where 96% of all the marine species, 70% of the terrestrial vertebrates all became extinct. And many of the plants did as well. And the plants died. And when they went into the ground, they made, they did generate and made what we now pull out as coal and oil from the ground. These are all from these extinctions. So the question is, every time you have an extinction, how did the animal and plant species regenerate after each of the extinctions? And in, every time it came down, when the CO2 went uh, too low, then you had an ice age. So at times the, the earth was covered with ice and was still moving along and things would change. But these are all the changes that happen and these are all the extinctions. But the question is, how did we get all the new plants and animals? On the prior slide, we just looked at the locations of the six massive extinction events, which created all the divisions between the eras. And this, in these extinction events, there was a eradication, a rad actually obliteration of a high percentage of the plants and animals. But there's a remnant, and over time they created all new species. So all species would come back each time and then be eradicated and so on and so forth. The question is, how was that accomplished? The Darwinian theory was developed. It said that transcription errors in the DNA allowed new species to begin. They had new DNA because the old DNA was uh, transcribed in an error, but it was good enough to live, and they, they now had a new species. Also, cross-species mating was another possibility. And then natural selection would weed out those species that were created by these mechanisms that didn't have uh, a strength to survive. Now, here's the problems with Darwinian theories. Each new species should have, its, should have a mixed DNA because it came from two different structures, two different uh, uh, species, so it should have some from this and some from the other. But the question, do they? And so that's what we're looking at uh, in today's science. The problem is that major transcription errors are usually uh, destructive. They, they seldom have ability to create a new species, and most of the time these will cause uh, the, the species to fall apart or to not survive. And the next problem is now we're starting to look at mitochondrial DNA. Of course, that comes from the maternal line. And there's one study that's out now called Analysis of the DNA Gene for Mitochondrial Cytochrome Oxidase C. And that's one that is an important, is a, an important gene for every kind of DNA, no matter where it is. And, it, and this was, and they looked at animals, and this is the, the two authors, and they looked at 100 species 100 from the gen, the gen bank. And it, which included both animals, plants, and human beings. And the question is, remember we said, is there evidence of multiple mixed DNA between the species? Or are they isolated and separate and had to have been created on their own? So let's just review that study, because it was quite large. But what it looked at, here's the principle. We already mentioned it. Here's this, this specific gene that they can look at and they can find in the mitochondrial DNA of all animals and plants and uh, human beings is present in all of them. Now here are the two choices. If there's multiple variations in this uh, DNA, that would fit with the Darwinian evolution where you can have species derived one from another. So you'd have some mitochondrial DNA from one source and another for another source. So it'd be inhomogeneous or heterogeneous DNA, mitochondrial DNA. Otherwise, you could have little or no variation, so a homogeneous mitochondrial DNA, and this would indicate that the species has been derived only from its own cell line, so it had to have been created and altered by then just adaptive evolution, 
to the environment. So here's the results of the, uh, the survey. Mitochondrial DNA survey revealed that there's very little variation for this gene in 100 animal species, indicating that they were a distinct cell line and not an admixture, not a mixture of different preceding species. So it's direct conflict with the Darwinian idea of evolution. Now the mitochondrial variation between human beings is clearly different from the hom hominids. So this means that man has not been derived from the hominids, apes, monkeys, and chimpanzees. It's so uh, commonly presented on the charts of evolution. So in summary, what are the major creative events that have happened in this part three of the formation of life? They include the dynamic DNA, which is the director, the instruction manual for every cell structure and function. The jolly green chloroplasts, which are able to make oxygen and glucose out of sunlight and carbon dioxide. And then the mighty mitochondria that provide all the fuel for our existence. Every single cell that's a eukaryotic cell has to have mitochondria. Only the plants get the chloroplasts, that's why we made it green. Every one of these organelles, these are all organelles, they have their own DNA. They're incredibly complex and every time you add as you go from life form from a single cell to multi-cell to multi to early animals with uh, legs, eyes, ears, all those things, every time you do that this the DNA in all three of these things must increase. We're going to show that in more detail in part four. But each organelle has its own unique purpose but they're all intertwined. You, there, there's the circle of life involves all of them. And the, the process is called symbiosis, where the, what, whatever happens in one plant may affect the next plant, and, and so on and so forth. Now, the new species developed after each of the major six extinctions. How did that happen? Darwinian evolution, the accepted Darwinian evolution seems problematic. Thus, are all of these creative events that remains to be seen. But it sure appears that the Earth was designed and created for life. Or you still just think all this just happened randomly? Here's the main takeaway for part three, just like it was in part one and part two. I get it. Once you start looking at the world around you, you will keep finding God's fingerprints everywhere. And that's true. Now you look out the door and you look at the, everything green and it, uh, you know, it, come, it has chloroplasts and it came way back at one billion years earlier and has made it all the way to the present time. What an, what an incredible creative design this is, our world is. In the next module we're going to look at the examination of life on Earth from the Cambrian period up to the present. We've already talked a part of that now but we'll finish it off on part four.